Hallo allir, velkomin á þannig föstags fyrirlestur. Uh, í dag verður hann Adnan Hendricks með okkur og hann verður með fyrirlestur Achieving Trust in the Cloud. Og hérna, hann er að þessu bara yfir okkur. Hann er með hérna uh, Azure MVP og uh, I'm just gonna uh, say hello to Adnan and say thank you for coming and, and uh, introducing us uh, next year to us and uh, of course, it's the second time you, you come to us and and uh, doing a lecture, and that is really great. Thank so you. I'll just give you the word. And thanks for having me again. Uh, always nice to be uh, invited the second time. It means you did an okay job the first time. So here I am, Adnan Hendricks. I do Azure, Microsoft 365, focus on security and uh, building infrastructure in the cloud. My session is achieving trust in cloud or building castles in the sky, you know. Uh, follow me on Twitter with at Microspecialist and uh, my company is Microspecialist Consulting. For those of you that don't know me or haven't met me on the second or previous show, um, you can contact always contact me through at Microspecialist or LinkedIn or uh, my email address. I have been in the business for quite some time, so even after the session, if you have some questions, you can always forward them to me or contact me at any time and I'd get back to you on that. So enough about me. The agenda for today, or at least the theme of the session, is really just looking at how you can fortify your infrastructure in the cloud pretty much like a castle used to be in the old days, depending on who you are, they used to be pretty secure. Some of my friends descended from the Vikings uh, living in the Scandic areas might not agree, but um, I leave it up to you, you know, if if the, the castle uh, method is secure or not secure. But briefly, we will touch on cyber trends, so we will look at what's happening right now, and then I will take you through some basic SecOps hygiene, some of the things you should already know, be doing, and then uh, looking at GRC, and GRC in my terms is governance, risk, and compliance, how you can go and apply governance, mitigate risk, and also be or use some sort of compliancy in standard. And then we're going to be looking at what's new in cloud security right now, and then leave you hopefully with some homework at the end of the, the session. Everything is digital. The cloud is pretty much mainstream right now. And the nice thing is um, uh, uh, there's always work for uh, people uh, in IT. Uh, someone once said, failing to plan is planning to fail. Uh, it could have been Benjamin Franklin or Winston Churchill or somebody. But the idea is basically that we, we're living in a digital age of cloud. We could pretty much set up a company in a day, get rich or poor buying crypto. The possibilities are endless. Or uh, like me, you could get locked out of your new car after an update. So uh, a, a lot of things that we uh, can't talk about. But this is basically the the state that we're living in when looking at uh, global security. Microsoft as a company analyzes 43 trillion security signals daily. And they are aware of 15 billion internet observations. They have almost 9,000 dedicated security researchers, engineers working with their security products daily, trying to keep you and I, our Azure infrastructure secure. And um, they block about 72 billion threats um, daily. So that's quite a lot of uh, risk to mitigate if you uh, can look at those numbers. And just to get an idea, you know, even if it's just a small percentage of those that do make it through, you end up with a problem. So we always, being the good guys that we are, we always on the back foot, because this is the situation that we're living in. Uh, it's always an attacker's advantage and defender's dilemma. And the thing is, we have to cover all the bases and an attacker 
only has to succeed once. So we have to make sure that we know all the endpoints that can be attacked constantly, you know, uh, keep the infrastructure secure 24 seven. And we have to play according to the rules, which means we have to conform certain compliance standards. We have to uh, work the way uh, the company uh, provides and also with the software that we allow to use. An attacker, like I said, only has to succeed once and they pretty much have a fair play. So looking at all those different um, threats that are out there, you know, uh, from exploit kits to breaching, denial of service uh, attacks, spear phishing, zero days, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there's uh, millions of them, you know, and like I always say, it's not really hacking if I bought your credentials. So it's a whole business, you know, business uh, out there uh, hacking. In fact, you, there are so many tools and ISOs you could download and start hacking away immediately. So the main focus uh, for you, for everybody, is really to start with things like MFA, password list, and zero trust. Pretty much the focus of my previous talk. So there should be a video of that you could like uh, go and review. Really, that's where your focus should be and your starting point. And uh, you really need to enable cloud protection services. Uh, quite often I get invited to sit in meetings uh, where a company A has already been uh, attacked, hacked, breached, and they need to start all over again. And then quite often, because their infrastructure was already based on, you know, technology, uh, on-premises technology, you know, more than 10 years ago, they still try to implement the same thing. And there I am, the cloud guy, advising them to use cloud products for the security. Needless to say, I don't always make a lot of friends that way. So um, I tell people what they need to hear, not what they uh, want to hear. Uh, meaning I don't always get the, the project because, you know, like I always say, nothing is 100%. You have to have a stacked security approach and try to secure from the endpoint to the cloud. Um, pretty much like uh, Microsoft's uh, view on security from chip to cloud security. So that's really you have to cover every base and you can't just you know, uh, close yourself off like an island and uh, try and do things that are uh, not of this day and age. So some of the cloud security challenges that we face, and this is also something that I deal with as a consultant, where I have to sift through all the public endpoints and things that might be a risk to a client. And most of the times, um, sometimes my client or the customer might not even know about certain loopholes. So some um, environments can be pretty complex, especially when it's hybrid environments. And also if the education level in cloud, the way to build the infrastructure, if they just start uh, doing something without a good plan, then most of the times there's a lot of correction that needs to take place. So, um, for example, a company in the Netherlands where I'm based got hacked back in uh, November, maybe even October 2020, um, and they are still rebuilding some of their systems. And in fact, you know, hackers were already in the premises when they changed some administrator changed uh, an admin password to welcome 2020 without MFA, and that's when the hackers pretty much owned the environment. So you need modern tools to fight modern uh, threats. This has always been the concern um, since you know we started in IT, and especially now with uh, cloud. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, privacy, and also with infrastructure and resources being spread across different data centers, regions, uh, different devices. You have to be aware of all these different points. So, you know, uh, fear of loss of control of data, making sure that the data is uh, secure and can be tampered with, and also privacy. Uh, that you have to worry about. 
Luckily, when it comes to Azure, security, privacy control, compliancy is all pretty much the controls are built into the cloud platform. And also how Microsoft manages and adheres to all our expectations. That's um, made aware to us through things like the Trust Center, where we can go and download those uh, compliance standards and documents that we can show to our auditors. In fact, Office 365 and Azure services were the first commercially available public cloud services to achieve CJIS compliance. It's one of the highest compliance standards in the world. So that's more uh, talking about the Trust Center where you can go and view uh, all these different compliance standards that Microsoft adheres to. And even then, um, I still come across a lot of clients that still don't fully understand that Microsoft only does a limited part in securing and keeping your data safe. 80%, if not more, is the responsibility lies with the customer. So that shared responsibility is also something that you need to be aware of and also take care of. So looking at some of the uh, security basics, and you um, you know we you still need to secure your operating system so even though you're running on the cloud daily accounts of hacks you know ransomware in the news uh, also where the biggest focus is right now um, you have to secure your hybrid infrastructure and this is where you're going to be provisioning accounts from active directory to azure ad and also uh, if you're setting up a connection from your on-premises data center to the cloud. So things like the usual uh, Windows Server networking, securing through network security groups, setting up firewalls, making sure that storage is encrypted, and also identifying and remediating specific security issues. Most of the sec security services within Azure, it's built in and there. So things like ensuring that you take backups and this ties back into the whole confidentiality, integrity, et cetera, because you have to make a backup of your uh, data. So Microsoft only makes sure, ensures that your copy of your data that's there won't get lost. But if you wanna get back a document that might have been deleted, you have to make sure that you have a backup of it. Same thing with updates, uh, etc. And Microsoft has tools like Auto Manage to enable updates, backups, etc. Including using things like Azure Arc, where you can mitigate on-premises uh, servers as if they were uh, cloud uh, resources in Azure. So lo when looking at securing Windows Server operating systems, and this is something that I'm just quickly going through because you should be already using exploit protection uh, with the built-in uh, Windows operating system and Windows Defender products, so where you can protect yourself through the security app on Windows or all the different Defender products that you can get, Defender for Endpoint, um, configuring things like application control, so uh, whitelisting applications, and also credential guard, ensuring that nothing can access the uh, core uh, of the operating system. And things like a smart screen, for example. Uh, ideally, if you're running Active Directory, you're still using group policies, so you can still implement OS security by using group policies. Then when looking at hybrid Active Directory infrastructure, the usual password policies, password block list, uh, best practice is always to use protected users to prevent accounts from being placed into the local administrators group. Things like hardening your domain controllers or even restricting access to domain controllers where you segmenting or only allowing certain clients to connect to specific domain controllers and then all the different delegations 
and uh, utilizing Defender for Identity that uses artificial intelligence and uh, algorithms that can secure your uh, identities. So these are just some of the basic AD uh, infrastructure security options. The server networking again, we have Defender Firewall, uh, Windows Defender, the firewall. We have domain isolation. We got the network security groups, things like VPNs that you can uh, utilize when running uh, uh, hybrid environments. And then the advanced um, threat analysis that you can get using Azure services with Defender for Cloud and as a Sentinel where you can do um, threat hunting, etc. But now, Focusing on GRC, so governance, risk, and compliance. Governance means, you know, a lot of things for a lot of people. And the best definition that I can give is really governance is how organizations decide they want to do business. Uh, look at your own life, you know, you, you have some standards that you adhere to. Uh, specific things that you might do to ensure that your house is safe, your family is safe, the way you drive, things that you need um, to protect yourself uh, or your uh, environments or assets, such as uh, a car alarm, uh, safety features, uh, etc. So in the way a company has specific policies or governance regulation or rules and they've decided that's the standards that they want to adhere to so the different um, services such as management group policy blueprints uh, etc are just some of the ways in which you can apply governance within your Azure infrastructure. So with management groups, you can define your organizational structure um, in your Azure tenant. So you could map your uh, resources and infrastructure in Azure to map to your company, the way your company is set up. For example, you might have a uh, global office and certain branch offices and within those branch offices you might have specific departments uh, you can generally map specific subscriptions to specific uh, management groups and then depending on what kind of rules and regulations you allow for each uh, department you can apply specific settings and regulation uh, compliance to those uh, specific management groups or um, departments in Azure. So utilizing policy, which is a way you can enforce compliance and also assess existing uh, resources within your infrastructure or specific uh, subscriptions. And you can basically enforce those standards within your subscriptions that are then tied into those specific management groups, for example. And because you have split up your company, for example, uh, a lot of times you'll have a company that has a uh, R&D department, they have a development test or production uh, environment, so they have different standards and policies and requirements for their production which might be very strict. So only specific uh, resources are allowed. And within the R&D might be more flexible, allowing more flexibility in what can be deployed where they can do some sort of testing. Then we have blueprints. Much like an architect's blueprint, a design of a building or a design of a product, you can have a specific blueprint that can define the way your environment looks like based on the resources that it needs to have, the uh, policies that it need to have and, and uh, settings, and also the kind of roles and uh, identities that need to be tied into that, along with the actual resources that are, are made. So we call those resources artifacts. So it's just a consistent way you can deploy a specific blueprint 
across, and this is where I'm using back to the managed group example, where let's say you're going to have the same sort of company structure in your different branches based in Amsterdam, Reykjavik, or New York, which means you could just deploy the same blueprint and just at the time of uh, assignment or deployment of the blueprint, you can go and specify specific names for the same uh, structures that are required across every specific uh, branch. And then things like resource graph that you can query, analyze, and also find uh, resources and information, uh, giving you that visibility within your environment at scale. And then cost and management where you can also um, keep a hold on consumption and spending within the different uh, environments. So we'll be looking at some of these things uh, a little later on in the demo. And then um, segmentation strategy, just like having the management groups where you can uh, split up your company based on its own hierarchy. You can segment your Azure infrastructure and subscriptions within those based on resource groups, et cetera. And also your networking segmentation needs to be on point. So some of the GRC, governance, risk and compliancy, is not just only to have your infrastructure based according to uh, GRC principles, but also in line or with the responsibility of support of the infrastructure, um, for example, uh, GRC across your network security, uh, your incident and response, your uh, identity and security, and also your network management and how you going to have individual roles that will be responsible for those uh, specific functions. So governance in Azure uh, is by assigning policy, uh, Azure policy that will either deny or allow a specific resource uh, to be made either through command line or the portal. So it's like a centralized control plane, whether you using a user or automation that can um, control your environment, ensure that nobody does something that they shouldn't be doing. I always say it's to protect you from yourself or your employees from uh, making mistakes. So this is just a, a governance view where you can see a lot of the uh, policies and the compliance states. And then you have a DevOps view where it shows a validation failed that will be denied by a specific policy that you have set. So I'm just going to go straight into my uh, first uh, demo. So this is my um, Azure subscription that we are in. And I'm just going to go to management groups. So you can see that you can go and have a root management group and then sub uh, management grouping uh, within there. I'm just going to collapse um, one management group that I have. For example, you have organization and it's split into business development and IT operations. So I can tie specific subscriptions to business, apply specific policies that will cater only to my business requirements, and then development might have some more flexibility where for example i will allow uh, a subset of windows uh, SKUs that can be deployed for example or uh, where the cost can be a bit more flexible and then it operations will have specific things that will apply to infrastructure that i'm using for my environment and have only a specific set of policies and standards uh, to govern what happens in those. So you could either go through getting started and uh, have a view at some of the examples, or in the overview, you could click on create and create a management group ID and a display name. 
and then it will be listed as a root group. And then once you have a, a management group, you can tie in a subscription. So you could add in a specific subscription uh, in your list to those uh, management groups. So that's uh, management groups. So once I have my management groups and I've uh, defined my hierarchy and I have my subscriptions, I can go and apply my uh, governance. So my uh, policies where I can base on specific uh, definitions. So firstly, in my overview, you can see that I already have a couple of policies in place and some of my uh, resources are not compliant. So depending on when you start with policies, like let's say you start in before you've created resources, it will apply immediately on the new resources. But if you already have existing resources within your subscription, it will just show the compliance state. Now with some um, policies, you can also apply remediation. So if they aren't compliant, they can be made compliant through automation. So just looking at some of the policies or def policy definitions, there's quite uh, a large number of uh, built-in policies. As you can see, the type of policies. I also have uh, custom policies and you have uh, different types. So you can have uh, a policy uh, definition or an initiative. And initiatives are basically a bunch of policies that conform to a specific standard. For example, if you look in the list, you'll see that uh, I have an initiative for NIST SP800 compliance, and there's also the revision 5, CIS, Azure security benchmarks. So it's basically a number of different policies that are grouped that define that specific uh, standard. So I know a lot of uh, companies in uh, need to conform to ISO standards and certain uh, financials into high trust or HIPAA standards, etc. So with all the different uh, definitions and policies, you could also filter on specific and some of the frequently created uh, policies are things that you might not want to allow or only allow specific resource types within a subscription or uh, things like uh, allow virtual machine size SKUs. So this is something, especially for those of you that might be uh, deploying Azure Virtual Desktop in some environments that I set up, we generally only allow specific machine SKUs for the Azure Virtual Desktop uh, environments. So whenever somebody needs to deploy, they can't make the mistake of deploying uh, a different SKU or a creating a new host pool where they just want to uh, utilize their own um, or decide to use their own. So allowed locations, um, especially because some companies want to have data residency so they only want to allow specific uh, environments or regions, Azure regions. So I can uh, try and assign this policy by setting the scope. I could also select a specific subscription. And then I can immediately have it enabled. Uh, next, I can go and select specific parameters. So this is where I can select a specific uh, environment or region or allowed location. So I could select North Europe and you might want to, as a best practice, also select the region pair. And it is over there. And I'm just going to ignore the remediation. You can specify a specific non-compliance message and then 
create the policy. So that will be created. And whenever I try to uh, create a resource and the location is not one of the two listed, it should just uh, deny uh, the policy. So if looking at that in um, the field, and we can just say create a storage account. Um, yeah, I'm just going to select a subscription that I already have that location policy applied. And just go next, next, next. Now it will go and first check uh, validation if certain uh, requirements are met. And if there is a policy that's also tied, it will also um, view those specific policy requirements. So it was disallowed by policy and it will give you the policy uh, location. Uh, very handy when you're doing command line is looking at the raw uh, message. And everything is JSON format, so uh, there you have that. Now, when looking at uh, blueprints, we can create blueprints that define things like uh, Azure policy, uh, specific artifacts or resources, and also role-based access uh, groups. So who can uh, act upon those? So you can create a blueprint by clicking create, and there's uh, you can start with a blank blueprint, or select an existing um, standard-based uh, blueprint. For example, if you uh, have um, a look at the Microsoft uh, Cloud Adoption Framework for Azure, you can go and utilize a uh, CAF Migration Landing Zone or CAF Foundation, where, which is basically the best practices for creating a starting up infrastructure according to Microsoft's uh, best practices. So I'm just going to click with uh, a uh, blank blueprint. Uh, give it a name. Uh, nest blueprint underscore. Make sure that you get the syntax right uh, just for testing. And you can specify the management group that this needs to uh, reside in or be saved at. Next, you can apply the artifacts. So this is where you can select uh, based on the different uh, artifact types. So you can specify uh, a policy assignment, a role assignment, also an ARM template so that it will go and deploy that specific resource, and also a resource group that needs to be uh, defined so but when you select an artifact type uh, standard g so this is where you can either set the values during uh, assignment or deployment of this uh, blueprint or by unchecking you can go and set a value in so this is where you can already give it a specific name that it needs to have so i'm just going to um, skip this uh, blueprint and show you some of my uh, assigned blueprints. So this is where um, these uh, blueprints are uh, applying policy on the subscription and creating a resource group artifact. And then I have another blueprint that creates a resource group, a virtual network, and a uh, network security group. So those are some of the uh, blueprints that are assigned. 
So here I have uh, a custom cloud adoption framework uh, that's unpublished. A company standard that's unpublished. So yeah, I've got uh, an assignment or subscription that I'm assigned to that it needs to create a user group or contributor role assignment uh, policy that's applied and it creates a resource group. So this is not assigned as yet. Yeah, I can go and assign it to a specific subscription and then it will go and uh, deploy or create those resources. So that's just a handy way you can have a script or a service that scripts specific items, artifacts, uh, or specific resources, things like uh, role assignments, Azure policy, ARM templates, and that can just be assigned to a specific subscription, and it will just go and create those uh, resources for you with those specific settings. So quite a handy way we can go and apply governance uh, from uh, day one across different uh, subscriptions. So I'm just going to go uh, back to my uh, presentation. And continue uh, with the presentation. So hopefully that gives you a good idea on management groups, Azure policy and also Azure blueprints. And now you can go and apply that. So that deals with some of the governance and also uh, minimizing uh, your risk. So you're setting up specific controls. Another thing that helps you in setting up specific controls and also utilizes Azure policy is Defender for Cloud. So Azure gives you a lot of ways you can go and secure, manage your cloud without even knowing uh, everything that you need to know to secure your resources or ensure that you mitigate uh, your risk or minimize your risk. So things like Defender for Cloud, Azure Backup, monitoring your cloud resource through Azure Log Analytics. Um, a lot of these services utilize Azure policy in the background. So Defender for Cloud is a great way you can secure your cloud resources and gain visibility and control across your Azure uh, estate. Uh, not just Azure estate, but across different, uh, the three main clouds, AWS, uh, and GCP, so Amazon and Google is, uh, Google Cloud, and you can proactively identify uh, any uh, risks that you might not have uh, covered, and you can quickly detect and respond to threats using the advanced analytics and intelligence that's built into the product. So it allows you to totally unify your security management within your Azure subscription and also protecting your hybrid uh, clouds. So I just want to quickly give you a run through. Back at the portal with Microsoft Defender for Cloud. One of the best things that you can go and run through to increase your security posture and there you can see that it has support for Azure, AWS and GCP is to run through the secure score dashboard. So that's a great way you can just go through some of the recommendations based on your different subscriptions. It will go and scan your resources and environment and recommend specific uh, settings and controls that you need to apply. So all these different scans are done by um, the built in Azure security benchmarks and also you can add any specific uh, compliancy or governance that you might need to adhere to within your uh, environment. So yeah, I can see a very high risk unhealthy resource and I can drill down into that and see what I need to do to enable that little piece of security. And in some cases, I have to just follow the how to to do a manual remediation and in some other cases i have a button where i can just quickly click on the button and fix that security risk so this is one of the best products uh, within azure that can give you uh, a nice overview 
of your security posture. So it has uh, recommendations. Uh, you have regulatory compliance that you can apply. For example, ISO, SOC, PCI. In fact, you can add specific or manage your compliance standards, and then you can evaluate which controls that you still need to tighten up to get 100% or as much compliance according to that regulation uh, standard. So this is where you can see where you still need to enable specific uh, controls and on which resources they need to apply to. So workload protections, depending on the type of uh, services and resources that you are running, for example, um, you could increase uh, app service or uh, specific uh, advanced protection on your uh, SQL databases, for example, or virtual machines. And especially for those of you doing IoT containers, um, you can have uh, container image scanning protection, just more advanced um, built-in protection. For example, file integrity monitoring, monitoring and adaptive application controls. Adaptive application control is a sort of uh, whitelisting of uh, applications and file integrity monitoring it will ensure that nothing will go and modify specific files running on those virtual machines within your azure estate just in time vm access you can enable access to specific virtual machines within the time that you uh, require them it's like only making the RDP port available for a limited time. And then things like adaptive network hardening, etc. So that's some of the uh, special protection that you can go and apply within your Azure infrastructure utilizing the Defender for uh, Cloud. But that was just a quick uh, run through of some of the features that Defender for Cloud provides within your Azure infrastructure. I can go on a whole day just talking about Defender for Cloud and what it can do uh, for your uh, Azure environment. So just quickly, something I'm really excited to uh, talk about is some of the new products or new security products that Microsoft announced just recently. And this is something that I really believe will add a lot of value. For example, uh, Microsoft Defender External Attack Surface Management. It basically allows you to see your business the same way an attacker would. So it is a product that will go and scan your infrastructure. So giving you a full 360 degree view of your threat exposure. And in saying that, everything that is discovered is pretty much available right now on internet. So it's a way that Microsoft will go and evaluate any internet facing and exposed assets, and it will go and find some uh, endpoints or resources that maybe you didn't know about. It will constantly monitor, discover devices, search for vulnerabilities that are, you know, active um, on those uh, resources and allow you to prioritize the exposure and just evaluate and ensure that you get to close those gaps before an attacker takes advantage of those uh, loopholes or vulnerabilities. So it will discover vulnerabilities and this is from the outside in. So whereas uh, Defender for Cloud is a product that will go and evaluate infrastructure that's internal within your subscriptions where you've got a virtual machine that might not have any public um, endpoint or accessible from internet, but it will still have some sort of vulnerability. That's where Defender for Cloud will help you. This product, uh, Microsoft Defender Ease M, which is what the acronym, it will look at your organization from the outside in. So from the internet perspective. So anything that's internet facing or exposed or 
uh, maybe you've heard of a Google hack. So anything that maybe Google has managed to uh, index within your environment, those kind of uh, data, those sensors and crawlers will just go and scan and provide you with an internet facing profile. So this is a view of what it will what it looks like, where it will show you based on uh, whether you've uh, got domains, uh, hosts that it found, internet pages, SSL certificates, IP blocks or addresses, you name it, even contacts that might be uh, listed on internet, and it will tie in the attack surface uh, vulnerability. So any CVEs that might be uh, specific to those uh, resources that you need to go and have a look at. So I feel this is a lot of value. It's going to save a lot of lives and a lot of, um, you know, heartaches. Um, uh, high severity observations. So allowing you to drill down into those resources. For example, here you can go and look at specific uh, resources or assets that have uh, specific vulnerabilities. For example, this asset might be vulnerable to uh, remote access. And then you can also go and see which um, services are running behind that uh, vulnerability or uh, loophole that's in that uh, resource. So in this case, uh, port 22, 179, with secure shell uh, running behind that, and you can go and uh, mitigate those. So a great product that's going to secure your infrastructure, helping you close those gaps before they are taken advantage of. And then another product that um, I'm still trying to see if it will add as much value as uh, this uh, Ease M, which is Defender Threat Intelligence. So this I see it basically for organizations that want to learn more about the, the group or adversary that's currently um, attacking their infrastructure. So it's basically allowing you to understand your vulnerability from the endpoint uh, to the internet. So you can accelerate your uh, remediation and also reduce your risk and the nice thing about threat intelligence, it can show you uh, enhance your existing uh, infrastructure. So discover threat actors targeting specific industries. Uh, you can go and search. It will allow you to understand how those attackers go to work and expose your infrastructure. And looking at how uh, they behave and Knowledge is power, understanding how an attack tool or vulnerability gets mapped to an endpoint. Um, there'll be libraries of information with searchable art articles that will just give you insights as to how you can go and protect yourself against those uh, vulnerabilities. So a lot of information that you can go and uh, evaluate right there. For example, um, here, giving you specific information on uh, endpoints, uh, the malicious score, and also the type of description or way that they will uh, start an attack, uh, for example. So something that, you know, some of these new products, we definitely have to go and evaluate. And just to quickly show you, in my uh, environment, I've actually enabled and this is the nice thing where the Microsoft Defender Ease M, external attack surface management, it lives within Azure, so the Azure portal. The threat intelligence is a totally apart, uh, separate um, application and system that's not running through uh, Azure. So it's a separate portal. The Defender, so I've got a instance that started up and you can see that it will show you your inventory. It's still doing a scan on 
the information that I uh, placed into it. So my attack surface is still being analyzed. So you basically have to seed it with domain names, public IPs or IP ranges, and then it will go and try and discover everything that it can find about your uh, environment. Remember, this is the same things that an attacker will be able to find because it's accessible through internet. If Microsoft can't find it, it's not accessible through internet or known through uh, internet. It will then do some ex sort of inspection. We have a view at the asset details after analysis, give you reporting, and then you'll have dashboards such as attack surface summary, uh, view your security posture, uh, be able to look at uh, GDPR compliance, OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, and then uh, any new discovering that you want to add. But like I said, mine is still being built. It takes anywhere from 24 to 48 hours, uh, sometimes more uh, in my case. And that's also because this is my demo environment, so I don't have that much uh, things that should be out on internet pointing to my subscription. But you'll see it will break down the asset types, You'll be able to query your inventory, have a look at that, your dashboards that will give you the uh, CVEs and risks that you're running. And also uh, any, a good one is domain expiration. Because one of the uh, biggest vulnerabilities within certain organization is that a domain will either expire or a company will no longer use a, an old domain but it will still be listed for some employees or not everybody within the company will know that that domain is no longer uh, production. So those uh, times or most times those domains will be either hijacked or bought by uh, an attacker and then utilized in that way on unsuspecting uh, employees. So this is really a product that I'm excited about because this will basically allow everybody to have that point of view of an um, attacker on your infrastructure. So uh, I believe in um, knowledge is power and having that information is just going to make it that much uh, secure. So whereas, like I said, Defender for Cloud is from the inside towards your external endpoints and will cover things that are not um, have an external internet facing uh, or also cover things that don't have an external interface. So think about um, insider risk. I'm sure you've uh, heard about what's happened recently, lately, uh, Uber hacks, um, insider risk where employees are being bribed to stick in uh, USB sticks so hackers can target uh, the companies in that way. And that's why you have to have zero trust. Always verify before you trust any access. And that's also why you need, and when we go through the uh, review, that's why you need those uh, cloud uh, products with intelligence that utilize algorithms that evaluate not only based on the risk of the device or the person or account, but also based on the scenario, how the process or resource is being accessed and evaluating all the different uh, resources in the chain to get access of that resource. Always choose a compliant cloud provider. And I've shown you how to utilize uh, management groups, Azure policy, how you can set up blueprints, utilize a role based access control, which you can also imply or provide within your blueprint. Uh, identity protection is something I speak a lot about, and you can never have enough of. If they have your identity, and you don't have MFA, then they pretty much uh, own your data. So ensure that you uh, tighten up 
your identities, uh, backups, always maintain backups, uh, utilize your advanced uh, defense products, uh, ensure that you have some sort of data protection or data leakage prevention. And this is where your Defender for Office is a great advance, especially protecting um, data infiltration and also uh, safe regulations through uh, email access. Constantly review architecture. You know what worked yesterday might not work today and always evaluate new security possibilities. So my uh, whole idea is that you know uh, you, you shouldn't really be trying to build traditional castles in the sky but really you have to review your architecture constantly and always ensure that you're protecting data and not just infrastructure no matter where it uh, resides so that's uh, pretty much it from me once again uh, thank you for listening and for joining the session. I'm Adnan Hendricks and uh, hopefully see you again on uh, another time. Yes, thank you. I'm trying yeah. to turn on the camera here. There you go. So uh, thank you for this, Adnan. Um, there's, yeah. uh, <laughs> there's one thing that uh, was uh, uh, you talked about this uh, reviewing, you know, the architecture. Uh, yeah. Um, the one thing that struck me is that when you have implemented all the policies and, and getting all the, you know, stuff working, mm -hmm. and you get all this information, you know, to you, then the hard work really starts. Yeah, because then you're getting all the information from the system. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Microsoft gave out, you know, a monitoring system for Git to review all the passwords in Git. Yeah. And uh, they noticed that even though they gave it for free for vulnerabilities in Git, no one changed. It was like I think one percent or something like that. So the hardest thing is maintaining uh, after you have configured and set up all the all the thing. Uh, that I, I, I think that we need to do something like uh, create some some maintenance plan after we have uh, done it. Do it regularly. Just not set up and go away. I think it's all um, like wildflowers and 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 you know, walking down the street. That's that's why I use this theme. Yeah. Because that's, that's how people built infrastructure in the old day. You know, you could build it and it was fine, secure. And then only when the new version of a product or operating system came, then we reevaluated the infrastructure mm -hmm. that we built. Now, you know, Azure is fluid. So it changes daily possibilities that didn't, have yesterday is now available so um you have to actually change your mindset you know and being an independent consultant for me i make something i teach people how to use it but i also tell them you know it's it's a living thing mm -hmm. the, exactly. the services could change exactly. i mean you microsoft says you need to modify this because otherwise you won't be protected mm -hmm. but I have to constantly tell people to read those service maintenance and updates messages and also go through uh, things because otherwise they just end up calling somebody like me consultant again to fix it again. And that's why I said in the beginning, we are doomed. But yeah, we always have work <laughs> with work. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Pe people don't listen. So that's my message. You know, don't build castles. Go and look at you. You you building something that's constantly in motion, just yeah. like the planet that's constantly in motion. That's that's the the meaning of life to keep moving. Keep moving. Keep moving. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, we're out of time. So if there's any questions, 
Uh, any questions? Or they can just uh, send me a message if they're still thinking about what they need to uh, ask or through you. You know how to contact me. You, we, we chatted earlier today. Yeah. I'm uh, always ready. So uh, just send me a message and uh, I'll get back to you in a, a little while. All right. So thank you for this, giving us your time sure. and uh, and showing this lecture it was uh, fantastic. And this is a really good mindset to follow. So hopefully till next time. Hopefully until next time. Thank okay. you. Thank and you. Have a nice week. Bye bye. You guys too. Bye bye. Bye bye.